The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey guys, a very warm welcome to all. So what a moment to cherish. So we manage to reach out to almost 5,000 uh, Citrix professional. Okay, and interesting part is out of 5,000, 3,000 responded us and more than 1,000 enrolled for this webinar. And I'm seeing uh, every uh, second. Okay, so people, uh, or rather I would like to say Citrix professionals are logging in into this webinar. Okay, so even if we have around 500 uh, consultant joining this webinar, it's going to be 4,000 uh, years of Citrix experience. So it's just it's just amazing. It's it's a historic uh, milestone for Citrix education, and this webinar it's been organized uh, by Citrix Education along with RPS and SSDN. So both RPS and SSDN are uh, the two largest Citrix authorized learning centers. Uh, in India. So let me set uh, the uh, context. So as you are aware, like we have three uh, product portfolio. So the first one is uh, digital workspace virtualization. Second one is networking and third one is uh, analytics. Okay, so today we're going to touch upon uh, the second port portfolio, which is networking. So majorly we're going to talk about ADC and ADM. So today with us, uh, uh, we have uh, Jeff Ashley. Jeff Ashley is with us uh, of last 25 years. So if you see uh, his overall experience in IT industry is more than 30 years. So by profession, he's a consultant and solution architect, but his passion is to enable and education, educate consultants. So he does train hundreds and thousands of professionals and aspirants every year. And, and also we have uh, Parvin Kumar. So Parvin Kumar, uh, his association with uh, Citrix technology is almost 15 years. So he does has experience in consulting and implementation. Okay, so the one uh, interesting part about uh, Parvin is he's so passionate about uh, Citrix. So he make it a point that every alternative day, so he does consume a glass of uh, uh, Citrix, citrus, citrus uh, juice. So that's a good thing about uh, uh, Parveen. And uh, another this one what is that a milestone what Parveen has achieved. He's the only instructor in APJ who has delivered almost all the training titles uh, in uh, Citrix education. And he's also instrumental and support you in, con in developing uh, the education content. And we have another gentleman, Anilsha. So he has been associated with uh, Citrix for the last 10 years. <laughs> he uh, was a Citrix solution architect, okay, but he always had a passion to support the professional to acquire and groom skills. So six years back, he decided that okay, he will no more pursue a career as a solution architect. He'll he'll going to be a CCI. CCI stands for Citrix uh, Certified Instructor. So he also does uh, train uh, hundreds and thousands of uh, consultants every year. And with regard to seminar flow. Uh, rather webinar so this webinar has uh, two section so at end of each section we will going to give a break uh, for q a and fenil shah uh, will going to play a role of a technical coordinator so fenil shah along with jeff Absley and of course supported by parveen uh, we will go into this one address all your question please use question box to post your question see please note that okay so this is a muted webinar you can't ask questions please post your questions in question box okay so before i uh, hand over uh, to jeff Ashley, i'm going to run a small video for you all
<laughs> okay. Uh, just one thing uh, I missed to inform you guys, and before we wind up uh, this webinar, so I am going to run through uh, the relevant education and certification required for uh, uh, the networking uh, product portfolio. Jeff, uh, over to you. Let me make you presenter, Jeff. Okay. okay. Yeah, Jeff, you are presenter now. Thank you. <clears throat> Very good. Karen, thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. And uh, with the other colleagues there, uh, thank you for attending, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. I really am pleased to be able to spend some time with you today. In the next 60 or so minutes, we'll consider the Citrix ADC, what it is and how business greatly benefits from its many features. The Citrix ADM, the application delivery management, assists in planning, monitoring, and protecting your vital enrollment environment, and all of its single management tools are located in the Citrix cloud. Again, thanks everyone for joining us today. And uh, let me verify one more time. Kieran, you can see my screen. Is that right? Yes, Jeff, good to go. You're loud and clear. Excellent, excellent, thank you. It is good to be with you today. And what we'd like to do uh, today, our goal is to look at, and in the light of a typical business need and real value, we want to consider Citrix ADC and ADM technologies how these technologies provide this value and business critical features will be discussed in the following topics. Topic number one is how important is business continuity? Topic number two is Citrix ADC for mission critical applications. Topic three, available, high availability, specifically high availability pairs. Topic for GSLB or global server load balancing. And then the fifth topic for today is Citrix ADM, specifically Citrix ADM for analytics. As part of the introduction, the topics presented to this webinar are in an executive briefing format. And that's because of the time schedule in this webinar. Uh, the top Topics that we cover take uh, a number of days in the instructor-led courses, but today we're going to be covering them in about 60 minutes. So it's going to be in an executive briefing format. These and many more related topics are covered in depth with reinforcements via hands-on labs, instructor-led lectures, and colleague interactions in Citrix official courses. The official Citrix classes are instructor-led, and in reality, they are the best preparation in enablement for the IT professional that's available today. I would like to point out that Citrix Workspace provides real value to any business um, end users and enterprise level offerings. Workspace app, we have uh, Within the Citrix workspace, we have the workspace app. We have Citrix content collaboration. We have Citrix endpoint management. Citrix secure browser. Citrix hypervisor, Citrix app layering, and CVAD, or Citrix virtual apps and desktops. And these are all within the Citrix workspace area. Tonight, or today, we're talking about the networking side, and the focus of today's webinar is the following technologies. The Citrix Application Delivery Controller, or Citrix ADC, and the Citrix Application Delivery Management, or Citrix ADM. In the networking, we also have other technologies, such as Citrix uh, SD-WAN, the Software Defined Wide Area Network. Citrix Web App Firewall, Citrix Gateway, Citrix Secure Web Gateway, and Citrix Intelligent Traffic Management are all part of Citrix networking. The question seems to be rather obvious, though. 
how important is business continuity? Businesses provide either products or services or both that customers want to or are willing to pay for. The reason businesses hire employees is to produce products and services. The company provides the tools that allow their employees to produce products and services. The company provides the tools that allow their customers to access and purchase these products and services. Well, all of this is considered as business, the business of our businesses, so to speak. Well, you get the idea. Well, I'd better go on before we confuse all of us. Business continuity plans and a disaster recovery plan. There are some differences in how each are structured. The business continuity plan consists of a business impact analysis, risk assessment, and an overall business continuity strategy. While the DPR or DRP, the disaster recovery plan includes evaluating all backups and ensuring that a plan to repair, recover, or replace any failed equipment. While the plans work together, they can be seen as two separate concepts. The, the first one, the BCP, or the business continuity plan is a plan to continue business operations even if one or many components in the corporate infrastructure fail. The uh, disaster recovery plan is a plan for access required technology and infrastructure after a catastrophic disaster. You might think I have a good business continuity plan in place already. So why do I need a disaster recovery plan also? Business continuity planning refers to strategies and protocols that enable a company to operate during and immediately after a tolerable failure. The key there is tolerable. A company's business continuity plan has evolved to become crucial, a crucial blueprint for guiding an institution through the process of preventing a business interruption. This plan outlines what needs to happen to ensure that key products and services continue to be delivered even if individual components fail. The key here is a tolerable failure. A tolerable failure is a failure of a component, a component that is protected by redundancy or high availability. In other words, if I have a component that fails and I have a replacement that instantly takes over, then that is fault tolerant. And we have the failure is tolerable. If we have a failure that is not tolerable, in other words, a component goes down that we do not have redundancy on, then we must have a disaster recovery plan to recover or rebuild that component. In other words, let me illustrate this. You get the idea. If it is a mission critical, we protect it with high availability or fault tolerance. So we have the client, we have access, and we have the products and services. So I've got my primary method of uh, having access, giving the client access to my products and services. So how important is business continuity? Well, the inability of employees to access your infrastructure means that they cannot produce the products and services that the company needs. And if the customers or the clients cannot access our products or services, they cannot purchase or transact business. In either case, failures cost money and lots of it. So on the screen here, I've got a client that's accessing my products or my services. But if that access goes away and that component goes down, if I'm fault tolerant, then I have an alternate method of gaining access and I still have my client able to receive my products and services or my end users, my employees are able to continue doing their work because I gave my access redundancy. So that is fault tolerant. And that's where we have our two plans. We have our business continuity plan and 
we have our disaster recovery plan. The second topic we're going to take a look at is the Citrix ADC for mission critical applications. The Citrix ADC can provide high availability protection for mission critical applications. The Citrix ADC load balancing is the feature that provides protection for mission critical applications. The application layer load balancing is the component we need to take a look at. Citrix ADC load balancing distributes user requests for web pages and other protected applications across multiple servers that host all the same content. The load balancer is logically located between the client and the server farm and manages traffic flow to the servers in that farm. The Citrix ADC can use any number of algorithms or methods to determine how to distribute the load among the multiple load balanced application servers that it manages. Persistence on a load balancing virtual server must be configured to handle certain types of web applications, like supporting shopping carts. Persistence overrides the load balancing method and routes all connections from the same endpoint to the same service. Least connections is the default load balancing algorithm and is concerned with protecting available resources from saturation. Application load sharing, distributed traffic between multiple servers to limit the bandwidth and capacity used on each server so that it maintains the performance and prevents outages. Application high availability provides fault tolerance and removes the dependency on a single server. Typical use cases are load balancing of websites, Microsoft services like Exchange or Link or SharePoint, load balancing of Citrix storefront for desktops and applications, load balancing of DNS, FTP, RDP, and SIP servers and services. Database specific load balancing is also available. Let me give you a couple of examples of how this load balancing component from the Citrix ADC allows us to protect our infrastructure. One of the first things that we can look at is link load balancing. Now, link load balancing balances the outbound traffic across multiple internet connections that are provided by different service providers. Unlike layer seven load balancing, link load balancing is a service representing a router or the next hop. Methods that are applied to link load balancing are round robin, destination IP hash, least bandwidth, and least packets. Ping is the default monitor, but configuring a transparent monitor is recommended. Monitoring is critical for link load balancing functionality and reliability. Another aspect of uh, load balancing could be the firewall load balancing or multiple firewall environments. The Citrix ADC appliance is placed between two sets of firewalls. The external set of the firewalls typically handle the egress traffic and the internal set typically handles the ingress traffic. Firewall load balancing is supported only for Mac mode load balancing virtual servers. Load balancing the firewalls provides protection against firewall failure and firewall saturation. We can even route a denial of service attack to a single firewall and route all other normal traffic to the remaining firewall instances. Another area where load balancing can be leveraged for protection is Microsoft Exchange load balancing. So the load balancing of Microsoft Exchange is designed to minimize external access to an Exchange deployment. That prevents possibilities of malicious attacks. The Citrix ADC handles all in internet-facing mail traffic. 
and also adds additional layers of message protection and security against viruses and spam. The primary design goal for exchange load balancing is for simplicity of scale, hardware utilization, and failure isolation. Load balancing can provide protection for Active Directory, DNS, DHCP, and AAA, such as authorization, authentication, and auditing. For example, a medical institution had a medical a mission critical application that constantly accessed Active Directory for current user object permissions. Even though they had deployed multiple Active Directory servers, the application was configured with the IP address of only one of those Active Directory servers. That created a single point of failure. Even if there were multiple Active Directory servers, the application communicated with only one of those servers. The solution is, without reconfiguring the settings in the application, we reassign the IP address from the Active Directory server to a VIP or a virtual IP address on the Citrix ADC, and then give the AD server a new IP address. Now, all permission queries are load balanced across all AD servers. An additional benefit is that the administrator can now add and remove Active Directory servers at any time without interrupting production. The third topic that we're going to be looking at today is Citrix ADC high availability. The third topic, high availability, up till now we have concentrated on using Citrix ADC to protect our back-end infrastructure, to protect applications, to protect resources. But what about protecting the Citrix ADC itself? We need to be able to do that. Well, we do that through high availability. And what you see on the screen is a typical two-arm configuration where we have a subnet one and subnet two, VLAN 1 and VLAN 2, and we protect the connectivity between the two with a pair of, a, of uh, Citrix ADCs. <clears throat> to set up a high availability configuration, you create two nodes, each of which defines the other's Citrix ADC IP address, or the NSIP address as a remote node. By logging on to one of the two Citrix ADC appliances that you want to configure for high availability, you would log on to that and then add a node. So you would specify the other appliances ADC, um, NSIP address as the address of the new node. Then you would log on to the other appliance and add a node that has been well, that represents the NSIP address of the first appliance. An algorithm determines which node becomes primary and which becomes secondary. That's the manual approach. If you use the configuration utility, it avoids having to log on to the second appliance. In fact, the, wither, the wizard asks what the IP address of the secondary node is and the password of that node. Then, with just a few clicks, and the two ADCs are joined into an HA pair. Remember, this HA pair is in an active-passive configuration. That means that all traffic goes through the active node, and no traffic goes through the passive node until there is a failure. On the Citrix ADC, there are three things that could possibly cause a failover event to occur. There, number one, it could be an interface failure on an interface that has HA monitoring enabled. The second reason for a, or common reason for a failover event to occur is the SSL card failure, or SSL being unable to be uh, unencrypted or terminated. 
The third reason, the primary is no longer responding to a heartbeat packet that was sent on UDP port 3003. Any one of those events can trigger a failover. Again, those events typically are an interface failure on uh, an interface that has HA monitoring enabled, SSL card failure, or the primary is no longer responding to the heartbeat packet on UDP port 3003. When there is an interface failure or SSL card failure, the primary system contacts the secondary system and notifies it of a failure. The primary system demotes itself to secondary and the secondary promotes itself to a primary function and then performs a gratuitous ARP call on all Citrix ADC IPs. When there is a heartbeat failure, the second reaches the loss, uh, looks for the lost heartbeat. If it exceeds the lost heartbeat threshold, then it promotes itself to primary status. If you issue the stay primary command on the primary device, then it gets preferred node status and will fail back when it recovers from that failure. Citrix ADC high availability. HA configuration is made of two or more Citrix ADCs working in a high availability configuration. Citrix ADC high availability is, as I said a moment ago, active passive or primary secondary. High availability doesn't cover upstream router failure or backend server downs or failures. Paired Citrix ADCs share a single configuration. Except for uh, unique NSIP addresses, one on each device, everything else is shared. The NS config will have different node IDs listed for the paired systems. A high availability deployment of two Citrix ADC appliances can provide uninterrupted operation in any transaction. With one appliance configured as the primary node and the other as the secondary node, the secondary node monitors the primary node by sending periodic, periodic messages called heartbeat messages or health checks. Those health checks or heartbeat messages determine whether the primary node is accepting connections. If a health check fails, the secondary node retries the connection for a specified period, after which it determines that the primary node is not functioning normally. The secondary node then takes over for the primary, and that process is called a, fail a failover. High availability ensures that if one node experiences a failure, the other node can take over because it has an identical configuration and it was on standby. On the Citrix ADC, we refer to the active system as the primary and the passive system as the secondary. In an HA configuration, the primary and secondary Citrix ADC appliances should be of the same model. Different Citrix ADC models are not supported in an HA pair. For example, you cannot configure a 10,010 model and a 7,000 model as an HA pair. In an HA setup, both nodes must run the same Citrix version. The primary and the secondary systems must each be configured with their own unique Citrix ADC IP address or NSIP. If you create a configuration file on either node by using a method that does not go directly through the GUI or the CLI, for example, importing SSL certificates or changing to startup scripts, you must copy the configuration files or the items to each of the nodes that it create the HA pair so that each node has the identical file on that node. And that must be done manually. Okay. 
high availability failover process, the characteristics of the primary node in a high availability setup is that they share IP addresses, such as the MIPS, SNPs, and VIPs, and they are active on the primary, on the primary node. A MIP is a mapped IP address, a SNP is a subnet IP address, and a VIP is a virtual IP address. The VIP is for inbound traffic, the SNP or MIP is for outbound traffic from the uh, ADC, the Citrix ADC, to the backend servers. Gratuitous ARP is when the Citrix ADC performs an ARP update against its own IP address. GARP is sent out by the new primary for all the floating IPs configured on the Citrix ADC HA pair. The GARP updates are staggered or throttled to 40 packets every 200 milliseconds. And we send two GARPs per IP address. The primary node responds to the address resolution protocol or ARP requests with its own MAC address. The ARP table of an external device, such as an upstream router, is updated with the floating IP addresses and the MAC address of the primary node via ARP or gratuitous ARP after a failover. That update is very, very quick. So a failover from a primary to a secondary node happens very, very quickly, often before an an IP connection can fail. Requirements for the uh, HA to configure the Citrix ADC nodes in a high availability pair, you need these um, standards. You need the same type of appliance. The RPC node password needs to be the same and requisite ports must be open. So to configure the ADC nodes in a high availability, you need the same NS password, NS root password, or not the NS root password, the RPC node password, because they're going to be sending the heartbeat back, back and forth using that authentication. You do not need the same NS root password because if they are different, they will propagate from the primary to the secondary. If the build is not the same, you can configure HA, but synchronization will not occur automatically until they match. The Citrix ADCs need to be the same type of appliances, such as all MPXs, VPXs, or CDXs, and the same version build of the system software. Well, that brings us to the midpoint of the webinar. So, Karen, could you please help moderate what questions we have so far? Sure, Jeff. Uh, Fenil, over to you. Sure, Kiran. So the first question is related to stateful failover in HA. So yes, stateful failover happens in max scalar from when secondary becomes primary, but it happens for the specific services type. So for TCP, UDP, any FTP and SSL breach, these are the protocols configured for the virtual server. We have a stateful connection failover. And always there is a NS on MSG or NS log can be viewed to see that what are the connections being failed over to newly elected primary. So that was the one question, Jeff, if you want to add anything in this for stateful connection failover. No, that's really good. The connection failover is very, very quick. Um, Again, the, the, the uh, gratuitous ARP update for the upstream router is the only thing that's needed. All the connections, all the IP addresses are live on both devices, but the secondary is a passive one so that we don't have to make those connections. We don't have to build that configuration. It's up and live. It's the upstream ARP table that uh, routes the traffic to the primary or the secondary. So it's very, very quick. Good answer. Perfect. Uh, there is one more question that can be configured more than two next scalers in HA. And 
that is not possible. So we have two net scalers in HA. If you want to have more than two net scalers, clustering is the option for you. Jeff, if you want to add anything. We cannot configure more than two in an HA pair, but you can cluster the um, ADCs in um, a multiple cluster, group cluster, one of those uh, nodes will become the cluster master. Now, typically, that will give you redundancy. It'll give you protection, but it is not an HA pair. Typically, when we cluster net scalers or the Citrix ADC, we cluster them to aggregate the throughput of the devices. In other words, uh, if I have um, gigabit throughput on each of my devices, if I cluster them, then I can get multiple gigabit throughput. Uh, load balancing my connections across all of the ADCs in place. Okay? Perfect. Thank you, Jeff. You bet. Yeah. So, uh, there is one more question. Uh, so that's a question that which protocol next scalar is using for HA? The um, protocol is just a, a heartbeat. Um, it is a UDP heartbeat that is between the two uh, devices. Now, in, um, in some deployments, uh, there you can create on a secondary uh, interface a private network between the two, or even just a crossover cable between the two devices. And so it's a UDP heartbeat between the two devices. Um, you can uh, use that. If your HA pair objects, if the uh, primary node is in one subnet and the secondary node is in a second subnet, then that heartbeat needs to move off of UDP to TCP IP in order to communicate with each other. At that point, you do a, a separate configuration in order for the HA pairs to talk to each other. But in a standard HA pair, the, the heartbeat protocol is a UDP-based uh, uh, heartbeat packet that's sent between the two. Perfect. Jeff, there is one more question related to DNS load balancing. Yes. So the, party, so the professional, uh, so Sudeep has asked this question. He has configured DNS load balancing, but he wants to apply application firewall related functionality on the VIP, which he has created. So that is not happening for him. So if you can give him insights. Hmm. Let's see. So. If I understand correctly, what you're asking for is uh, two different functionality on a single IP address. You want to do DNS resolution or uh, DNS load balancing on a IP, and you also want to do uh, firewall load balancing. Is Am I uh, understanding the question correctly? Uh, no, Jeff. So what he wants to do, uh, he has a DNS virtual server, so he has a VIP. Okay. And and he has uh, uh, he have, he wants to configure application firewall features, web app features, on that VIP, but he can't see all the features available for the DNS uh, load balancing VIP. Okay, I see what you're saying. Um, you can only have one uh, VIP or one IP address per uh, virtual IP. Okay but you can have different ports. So DNS is going to be on one port and your, uh, your application firewall is going to be on a different port. So you can have the same IP address bound to multiple virtual servers as long as they have a unique port, okay? Um, okay we would need to look at the different configurations to troubleshoot uh, where those uh, ports are bound and what type of policy we bind to those virtual servers to make sure that the action 
is what we were looking for. Okay. Exactly. Exactly, Jeff. And I can share one of my experience that one of for one of the project we have implemented uh, denial of service protection, DDoS protections for uh, those kind of virtual servers. So that can be implemented, but we need to look into a specific scenario to address. So there's one more question coming from Navin uh, that can we configure active active in HA? You cannot configure active active in an HA pair. The, the way the system is set up, it is going to be active-passive. If you require active-active, then there's a couple of different ways to do that. Um, at the university level, we ended up doing this, and we the requirement was active-active. So what we did is we created two active-passive pairs and put, an act, put a load balancer in front of that so that we would load balance across active active okay so we had two active active being protected by an ha pair or a passive so in other words what we did was we created an active active high availability using four nodes instead of two the other way to do active active as i said a moment ago is in a cluster okay True. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Jeff, there is a last question, and that okay. is related to logs. So, what part, uh, Pari Paritish asking is in accordance uh, in accordance with secondary node monitors, primary node. Is there any logs we can refer with to check health status manually? So, I think uh, yes, uh, we can. Jeff, if I can answer. Uh, Yes, the log so, files are unique to the device, but yeah. you have the Citrix AD, um, the ADM, which allows you to pull the logs from each of the devices from a single point of, of view, a single pane of glass, a single management port. You're going to be able to look at all of the log files on all of the devices. Okay, it gives you a, a well rounded. Uh, so to speak, a 360 degree view, being able to look at the logs from both devices at the single transaction that took place. And you can see the timestamps and everything, uh, but the log files are specific to the devices. So we use the external management component to pull the log files and make them available to the administrator in real time, okay? Perfect, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Now, I think we have a few repetitive questions, then I would handle it over chat. Maybe we can move on with the next model. Absolutely. Well, let's get back to the fourth topic of this webinar. The fourth topic is GSLB, or Global Server Load Balancing. What is it? Well, to put it very simply, Global Server Load Balancing is basically DNS management. We use DNS to resolve requests. We request an exchange server. We, <clears throat> that request goes to a DNS server. The DNS then will respond with your exchange server can be found at this IP address, 10.24.62.128. So DNS management is what global server load balancing does. So if an end user, customer or employee asks for a resource, we can then load balance that request across multiple data centers, even if the data centers are uh, distributed globally. Okay, so that's what GSLB does. GSLB does not route the connection what it does is it routes the resolution or the DNS component in the query, okay? So in other words, if I'm asking for exchange and I happen to be in Europe and I've set up GSLB for proximity load balancing, then I will be routed to the exchange server closest to me in Europe. If I am traveling in the United States, then I would get 
my request for an Exchange server routed to the local uh, instance. If a site goes down, GSLB can route around the downed site to the next preferred site or the next closest site. So let's take a look at GSLB. <clears throat> purposes and use cases for GSLB or global server load balancing obviously is disaster recovery. Disaster recovery provides an alternate location for accessing resources in the event of a failure or a means of shifting traffic easily to simplify maintenance or both. The second one is load sharing. Purpose of GSLB is load sharing. It distributes traffic between multiple data centers to manage bandwidth costs, to manage the load to the capacity of any given location. We do the load sharing to reduce exposure to various issues, including outages, natural disruptions, and so on. The third use case for GSLB is performance. Performance allows us to position users closest to the content, which enhances the user's experience. It's much more expensive to bring a profile and files to the data center where I'm connected. It's a lot easier and a lot less bandwidth and a much better end user experience if we move the connection of the user to the application that is closest to the data and the profile. And then there is legal considerations. Those legal considerations can be addressed with GSLB or Global Server Load Balancing. The legal considerations present users with different versions of resources based on geopolitical locations that allows us to stay compliant. The GSLB architecture, global server load balancing, again, is a DNS-based technology that provides disaster recovery and ensures continuous availability of applications by protecting against a single point of failure in a wide area network. GSLB can balance the load across data centers by directing client requests to the closest or the best performing data center or to a surviving data center in the case of an outage. The following example demonstrates the process of a GSLB conversation. The client enters a website, say www.gslbsite.com, into a browser. The system of the client sends a DNS lookup query for that website to the name server that is configured. The name server returns the IP address for a known name server who is authoritative for that website. And it is delivered by the root server. The return address will be one of those registered for the site. The top level servers or root servers circle through the list round robin and will return the next IP address in line. The client queries the Citrix ADC system in the GSLB configuration at the IP address returned in the prior step. The Citrix ADC system, based on its configured load balancing method, returns the IP address the client needs to query for the service that it is looking for, such as HTTP or HTTPS. There are design considerations. Design considerations could be application proximity, which network should carry the load, persistence, or user data. Under the application proximity, some applications do not support multi-site deploy deployment due to complexity, synchronization, licensing, or other factors. Which network should carry the load? The location of the application data determines which network should carry the connection traffic. Persistence. Many applications require persistence upon uh, continuity of their user interactions, such as a shopping cart. 
or it could be a, uh, a security key that is required in order to access the data. And then user data. Considerations of user data, such as roaming profiles, can be replicated across sites so that user request redirections to any site is permitted. And we would need to do that, replicate the user data, if we used one of our sites as a disaster recovery site. So if the primary site went down or suffered an intolerable fault, then we could redirect traffic immediately to a backup site using GSLB without changing the uh, URL that the users are using to gain access to that disaster recovery site. In an active active mode in GSLB, both the NetScaler appliances service the network traffic for the domains for which the appliance is authoritative. To ensure that data is consistently available at each distributed data center. Active active data setup, if site one receives the client request, the GSLB virtual server in site one selects a load balancing or content switching virtual server and sends the virtual server's IP address to the DNS server, which sends it to the client. The client then re, uh, resends the request to the new virtual server at the new IP address. As both sites are active, the GSLB algorithm evaluates the services at both sites when making a selection as determined by the configured GSLP method. That's in an active active data center setup. Now we can set up in an active passive data center setup, and that's typically the case when we only have two data centers and we're using the secondary as a disaster recovery option. So if data site one, if site one goes down, site two then becomes operational. When the client sends a DNS request, the request can land in any of the sites. However, the services are selected only for the active site. Now, how do the two sites know which one is active and which one is not? We use MEP data or MEP as a protocol to communicate with um, between the GSLB nodes. So as long as it is up, the MEP data will declare that. Services that are uh, from the passive site are selected only if the active site is down. To enable a smooth failover in the event of a disaster, an authoritative DNS query are addressed only by the active sites. Passive sites become operational when the active site it goes down. Another consideration is proximity. GSLB proximity considerations, you have static proximity and dynamic proximity. Static proximity determines the site to direct the client data to. Dynamic proximity uses a dynamic measured RTT or round trip time in order to decide where to send that connection. Static proximity, client sends a questionable or a request to resolve that item, that, that item, uh, information related to the domain is stored at three data centers, and the, you can have a site uh, static proximity database. To add a third party static database file, you would need to add that file to each of the Citrix ADC appliances in the environment. Monitoring, we use metrics exchange protocol, is used to synchronize the data used in GSLB calculations across sites. Three types of data are exchanged. Site metrics, uh, the site metric exchange is a polling exchange. Network metric exchange, um, the LDNS, the local DNS round trip time information is used for the dynamic proximity load balancing. MEP communication is accomplished between each of the GSLB sites on TCP port 3011 or 30, uh, 3009 
for secure communication and therefore must be open on all firewalls between the GSLB nodes. It is necessary to have MEP enabled on all GSLB sites. Now we're moving on to our final webinar topic, Citrix ADM for analytics. The fifth and final topic of our webinar today is Citrix ADM for analytics. Now, the Citrix ADM product um, is very robust. It allows us to manage all of our nodes in multiple fashions, but we're going to, because of time, focus in on just the analytics portion. So what is Citrix Analytics? Well, Citrix Analytics collects data across the Citrix portfolio of products, and it can gather information and analytic uh, metrics from third-party products. Citrix Analytics generates actionable insights, enabling administrators to proactively handle user and application security threats. We can improve application performance and support continuous operations. Citrix Analytics is available as a cloud service delivered through the Citrix Cloud. Citrix Analytics gathers data from the products and uses built-in machine learning algorithms to determine or detect anomalous user behavior monitor and troubleshoot user sessions and to view operational metrics for users across an organization that is using Citrix products. I wish I had hours or even days to share with you the exciting world of Citrix analytics. In the meantime, and the time remaining on this webinar, let's concentrate on security analytics. Security Analytics is an analytics service that allows you to monitor and identify inconsistent or suspicious activities on your network. It provides actionable insights such as user behavior and usage based on indicators identified across users, endpoints, network traffic, and files. Recent studies indicate that online threats have evolved to attack company resources from within. Protecting internal users from an imminent attack is as important as protecting the company's network resources. Corporations must be able to shield its network resources and apps from any unauthorized or suspicious access. Users within the company share network resources such as the internet. As a security officer, your objective must be to monitor and identify events that are potentially suspicious. The events can also become inconsistent with the requirements or procedures within the company. When a user connects their mobile devices or laptops, monitoring those connections and flagging those events become very important so that potential threats can be predicted and time is avoided. Citrix Analytics is an analytics service that allows you to monitor and identify inconsistent or suspicious activities. It produces a risk score. A risk score is a value that indicates the aggregate level of a risk a user poses to the network over a predetermined monitoring period. The value is dynamic and is based on user behavior analytics that studies the and determines patterns of user behavior. These algorithms are applied to analyze anomalies and indicate potential threats. For a defined monitoring period, a risk score, again, is an aggregate of the risk indicators that are triggered for each user. A risky user is determined by their behavior, such as links they visit. A risky user associated with a risk score can either be one of the following, a high risk user, users who represent immediate threats to the organization, or a medium risk user, users who could have multiple serious violations of their account and must be monitored closely, or low risk users, users who may have some violations detected on their account, but for the most part, they do not risk the network. 
A watch list is a list of users that you want to monitor for potential threats. We can also create policies. You can create policies on Citrix Analytics to help you perform actions on user accounts when unusual or suspicious activities occur. An action is what you or the machine language responds to suspicious events to prevent future uh, events from occurring. You can take actions on user accounts that display unusual suspicious behavior. For example, let's say Kieran is an employee and he never works on Saturdays, but last Saturday, he or someone using his credentials tried to log in. The analytics system noticed that the behavior was not normal for Kieran and it triggered, based on administrative configuration, a deny to the logon. It also sent a message to the administrator and it logged the action. We can configure any or all of these actions to take place. Let's take a look at some of the dashboards. There are three security dashboards where you can view details about user behavior. User dashboard, user access dashboard, and the app access dashboard. The user dashboard provides visibility into user behavior patterns across an organization. On the user dashboard, we can drill down. From there, we can click on more details and we would be able to look at what devices that user has connected with. The number of devices used by the user, where the devices uh, connected with, uh, what length of time, what operating system. Uh, we can even see a trend view link at the top right corner, which provides a graphical representation about the user device's history for a specific time period. We can drill down and look at the locations, the places from which the user might have logged into that environment, the locations. We can drill down and see what data usage was consumed by the user, including data uploaded or downloaded, files uploaded or downloaded, and file shares that are shared or deleted. Citrix Analytics collects this data from the Citrix Content Collaboration. Click a username, then navigate to user info to view the details of the data usage for that user. There also is a trend view. We can look at, based on the user, the applications that were used. <clears throat> the number of applications accessed by the user during the time period. Citrix Analytics collects this data from the Citrix CVAD or Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktops. You can click the username, then navigate to the user info. Again, we have a trend view. We can see what applications, how long they were used, how long it took to access those applications. The next dashboard is the user access dashboard. The user access dashboard summarizes the number of risky domains that were accessed and the volume of data uploaded or downloaded from those risky domains. If you drill down into that dashboard, you can click more details to, to view a complete list of users who have accessed those risky domains. In the top risky users by the data download volume section, the dashboard provides the details of the top users who have uploaded or downloaded large volume of data from the domains that are categorized as malicious or dangerous by access control. It provides the user account name, the volume of the data uploaded or downloaded by the user from the risky domain. The next dashboard is the app access dashboard. It summarizes the details of the domains, URLs, and apps accessed by the user in your network. For selected time frame. In the app access summary section, the dashboard provides an overview of the number of malicious domains, dangerous domains, unknown domains, and clean domains accessed by users in your network. It also provides the volume of data from these risky domains. We can look at it by domain. You can see the different domains, the category, what action was taken, and how many users went to that domain, or we can uh, 
filter the report to show by category. We've established the category gaming, lottery, program downloads, and so on. So we can categorize the access and we can see the top risky categories in this section. The category to which the domain has been categorized by access control. The number of users who have accessed that URL with the increase in trend or the number according to the risky domain. Citrix Analytics gathers data and provides the following insights. We have security analytics. It collects and provides visibility into user and entity behavior. You can track all aspects of user behavior by leveraging advanced machine learning um, algorithms. You can distinguish between normal employee behavior and that of a malicious attacker, thus enabling you to proactively identify and manage internal and external threats. We also uh, collect data in performance analytics, provides visibility into user session details. Using this data, we can organizations can proactively monitor and troubleshoot issues that arise during a user's logon, and then operational analytics. Well, how important is business continuity? Citrix ADC for mission critical applications, high availability pairs, GSLB, and Citrix Analytics. That's what we covered today in our webinar. Again, this brings us to the conclusion of our webinar today. I and everyone at Citrix Education wants to thank you for attending. Kieran, let's talk for just a moment about some questions and then about uh, how to get further training on each one of these topics. We've just briefly mentioned them. There's a lot of information that's available on each of these topics. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Fanil? Yes, Kiran. So I think all of the questions are answered over the chat. So I don't think so there is some specific questions left for us, Jeff, now. So we can move to Citrix Education discussion. Very good. Yeah, excellent. Uh, Fenil. Fenil, can you just confirm uh, that you see my screen? Yes, I can. Excellent. Uh, hey, Jeff, uh, uh, thanks a lot once again. Okay, so I, uh, I could see some this one or that private messages from uh, participants craving for more, more from you. But unfortunately, because of time constraint, so I don't think so we can this one or that have uh, the more uh, modules covering today. Maybe some other time <coughs> we will try and cover other modules also. Kieran, thank you for the opportunity. I really enjoy working with you and your team there. Um, Parveen, Vanel, thank you. Excellent, excellent colleagues and uh, you're in good hands. Okay, great. Thank thanks. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Yeah, so uh, let me this one already that uh, remind you uh, once again. So this uh, webinar is organized by uh, Citrus Education in association with uh, two of our largest uh, training partners in India, RPS and SSTN. So when it comes to education, it's very important. Uh, so we need to understand what are the delivery methods. So currently we have three delivery methods. <coughs> the first one is instructor-led training. Second is virtual instructor led training and third is e-learning. Okay, predominantly consultant going for training and certification. So we suggest to go for instructor led training. E-learning is for those okay, who wish uh, to take the training when uh, they are on move. So when they can't block for five days or maybe for 40 hours. So apart from that, there are this one only that SIs and corporates. Uh, so the request for uh, the project specific training uh, so when i say project specific training basically i'm talking about customized training so if there is any such request so please get in touch with us we do this one provide customized training and last but not the least after completion of training most of our five days duration course, uh, courses are bundled with exam voucher so you can go to pearson, Cent pearson center and take appear for the certification exam so as I said earlier, so we uh, have this one already that uh, three product portfolio. Of course, uh, the education product portfolio, it's still not in sync with uh, our new product portfolio. I said earlier, we our new product portfolio is digital workspace, networking and analytics. 
okay so endpoint management is also now now it has moved to this one what is that digital workspace so so i am going to talk only about uh, uh, the uh, networking uh, product portfolio in terms of certification and uh, training okay if you see on left hand side so right from this one what is that cetric certified associate to professional expert so we have training across all the certifications so let me go to the next slide okay so here it is so these are uh, the four important uh, uh, the titles what we have so we have cns 220 cns 3 triple uh, 2 320 and 420 okay so if you see uh, the first two uh, from below so these are the trainings which is required for you to get certified on citric certified associate <laughs> for, for professional we usually recommend 320 and for expert cns 420 is required in terms of process how you need to get certified pretty pretty simple okay so the first thing is that you need to get the recommended training <coughs> by us or by from our cal and the second one uh, once you just want to that complete the training it's important you uh, go through the preparation guide so unless you are not confident that yes uh, now i am thorough let me go uh, to pearson center and take the exam so once you are done with that go to any nearest near nearest pearson center and take the take the exam so then yeah once you clear the exam you are uh, certified uh, so in associate or professional or expert and please understand it's progress you know when i say progress you <coughs> for you to become this one professional it's must that you need to have associate for you to become expert it's must that you need to have associate and professional okay so now it's very important uh, so how uh, you need to get enroll and train very simple no need to worry so what we what we will going to do so immediately after this uh, webinar maybe today evening or tomorrow we will going to communicate with all parties participants okay so our calc will going to communicate uh, with all the participant it will going to have the details of uh, the uh, training title and of course the schedules also so after that you can start communicating uh, with your uh, respective cal and if you are individual no issues you can go and enroll to our cal open calendar if you are a corporate if you want to send group of people no issues we can have this one or that private uh, <laughs> schedules dedicated for you guys okay so since uh, we have time constraint so i am not going to take uh, uh, any questions related to education of course we will going to get in touch with you so when we get in touch with you individually or maybe uh, to your discussion or the lnd we will going to discuss in detail how exactly uh, the schedules work uh, and what are the deliverables and what are the commercials okay so thanks once again have a nice evening